It was a pleasure to be invited on a tour of the magnificent two-acre garden of Bishop's Hull residents Jane and David Gurr yesterday. This video, although fairly long, is half the original length and hopefully shows off this wonderful garden in all its glory. Well, hello everybody, I'm at uh, a lovely, it's almost like a country garden, but actually this is in the village of Bishop's Hull. Sort of the best kept secret, I think. And I've been invited here with uh, by David Gurr today. David, hello there. Hi, John. Nice to yeah. see you. Welcome to so our garden. David, thank you very much indeed. So tell me a little bit, well, a little bit about your garden. You've got a, a couple of acres here, I, I believe. Yeah, so the whole site in total is about two acres. The house is very centrally positioned in, in that uh, space. And we've got gardens all around. We've been here 11 years, so oh, we've right. had to follow uh, a basic structure that was already in place and as you can see from the Wellingtonias here we've got examples of very mature trees uh, and the um, other trees along here including the uh, Crotagus here with with more conifers so we've had to work with a, a very large existing structure. Lovely range of green isn't it so yes. many different greens yeah and you'll see as you go around the garden there is a vast range of greens and a lot of them are evergreen which makes it interesting year round yeah garden where we hosted the Taunton Thespians ah, last year. I remember, year. yes. And we had a wonderful evening, didn't Very we? Very successful. hundred odd people, wasn't it? We had, I think, 90 guests were uh, down this end and the stage up at this end. Yes. So it was a really tremendous evening. And of course, we were hoping to be hosting them again this year very soon. But of course, as we know, it's cancelled. Such we've a already, shame, isn't it? We've already uh, put a name forward for next year. So we're going to have it here. Brilliant. 2021. Brilliant. But when they when the thespians are here, the roses are, have gone over by then. So I just thought it'd be interesting to show you what we've got over here, because I think that's quite a magnificent display. Gosh, yes. Bearing in mind the date we are, we're so only the third week of May, I think, and I'm already having to deadhead some of these, which is pretty That's impressive. much too early, is it? Much too early. Showing my ignorance of flowers, I'm afraid. Yeah, but... so, well, it's not a question of being early, it's just that it's earlier than one no might normally expect. But then this one is just coming out now. Oh, and this see. one yes, called Absolutely Fabulous. And this is the one that won the individual You can see why, David, can't you? Yeah, exactly. And again, the scent from here is fantastic. And uh, it was a rose from here last year at the Bishop's Hole, Bishop's Hole Flower Show that won the, the best rose, ah. individual rose. Oh, these are beautiful. And these again, David, were called? So, um, the one on the left is Pilgrim, and the one on the right is Princess Beatrix of Denmark, I think. But I'd have to, <laughs> How uh, you remember them, I'd I don't have to know. check that one out again. A beautiful green again, isn't it? Oh, yes. And this particular plant, I thought I'd mention it to you, so Cornus, Cornus Cusa. This is Norman Haddon, and apparently Norman Haddon lived in uh, either Minehead or Porlock. And you can see that the bracts come out a nice cream with a pink tinge at the end. And you can see all these are just about to be coming out. Bear in mind, this entire area that you're looking at here was all set for a vegetable area, vegetable growing, when we first moved in. You can see that we've moved on a wee bit from there. So again, if you can get the scent, because we can get that from the wisteria that's behind us. So here we've got what is basically a white and blue garden. That's what we're trying to do, so everything that comes oh, in see. here should be white and blue as we move and, and put things in. And here we have the dahlias that I have yet to put in, but we'll be putting in later on this, uh, this week. So again, it will be very unusual for the third week of May to have dahlias in flower oh, to this extent. But this is a climate issue, is it? Or well, one, I, I actually overwinter them in the greenhouse. But it is very much the fact that we've had such a warm spring that it's uh, brought everything on. This so. is a beautiful area of garden, isn't it? Actually, this, this is probably a, perhaps a little lar larger than the average garden, but certainly half of it would be about average. So it yeah. shows what can be done, doesn't oh, it? Yeah. Even with a quite a relatively small space. going on. We have an array of fruit. Uh, the figs are doing well this year. Um, and we'll show you other fruit as we go along. So yeah, so for a blue and white garden, clearly there's some that's yeah. that are straight. Cool. So we've got the geraniums, some more cannas, chrysanthemums here I'll be taking cuttings from, calendulas, uh, some more dahlias. And of course we start to move into the vegetable 
production area. So from the I'm being really, bit, really sick. I'm sure, Dave. But what, what are these? The, these are canna, canna lilies. Oh right. So uh, grown for uh, the colour of the large leaves. So they're dark. They're a little bit different. So I'm going to show you sure. show them in situ in a moment. But these have a lovely bright orange flower, and then you have uh, a smaller canna, which I'll show you up there again. Right in a greener leaf um, and, and there they have um, a, a more of a tangerine type flower that comes out. Gotcha. So if I just come around this side keeping at a distance, in fact John if you just come this side yes. you can see the broad beans are now starting to fill out their pods. Oh yes I so, see. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. we've got a, a good crop coming on there. They yeah. even look healthy don't they? Yeah they're good. Um, here we have an asparagus bed. Have a number of seeds in here with the runner beans. So when do all these come through, David? Is that, oh, is these, that these will be coming through any day now, hopefully, okay. so, as long as they're watered and looked after. So that's a bed I'm still to work on. Then we have sweet corn, mange too, so the peas we eat every day. Yes, yeah. Um, sweet corn coming up, uh, some squash, uh, dwarf French beans, and some courgettes. And you eat these yourself? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. This, this is for everybody here on site. And then here we have the potatoes from the main crop down here to the first earlies up at that end. And then over here... We it's like the uh, TV programme, The Good Life, isn't it? Uh, well, we like to try and get as much as we can. Yeah, it's quite right. Which, of course, in the current climate is not a bad thing. It's a good thing. And then at this end we have the garlic, the red onion, developing, uh, been developing over the last couple of years. And this is all about being bird, bee and butterfly friendly. Okay. So every plant that goes in here comes off the pollinator list from the RHS. So everything here has got to be helped in some way, shape or form. And of course some have worked, some haven't. But what we're trying to do is build up something that's attractive to nature if we possibly can. Absolutely. So we've got beds here that I'm planting up. Different types of uh, shrubs, herbaceous plants. Uh, annual flowers that I'm actually uh, using as plug plants that's going into the lawn and as a result we're hoping that we're going to get more insect activity up here. There's a lot of talk at the moment David about um, getting pollinators attracted to curbside so the sides of roads Absolutely. rather than just grassing them is actually planting them out as it were. But Would that be difficult to do do you think for the local it, councils? It's not as straightforward as it sounds uh, and the thing about uh, plants that uh, are pollinating, uh, sorry, plants for pollinators, is you have to have a season, if you possibly can, from very early on in the year. So we have a, a plant, which, which I won't show you now because it's not in flower, but the first one uh, that attracts the bees will be open in January uh, and flowering then. So we've sure. got a few uh, shrubs in the garden that are like that. But to just plant up head, uh, curbsides, the thing is they've got to be looked after and they can look magnificent for a month of the year. And are you happy to then just see what they're like for the other 11 months, which, which is a challenge. I presume then they just look like weeds, do they not? Well, the, well weeds are some of the plants that you want to yeah, grow. So for yeah. example, in here, hopefully you can see I'm, I'm cutting paths so I can walk between them. For each of these areas, I'm trying to allow to just come through. Uh, so yeah, yeah. what we call weeds, so buttercups, for example, great because they attract, the daisies attract, so this is the start of things. Um, the flower at the back there, you just see the light, the blue flower with the green, the, gr that's yes. the green alkanet. Gotcha. So the bees absolutely love that. But if I allow that to grow there, it's going to go absolutely rampant. So I have to be very careful. Um, so here we've got a blue sage. That's that's great for, for attracting. But what I'm also doing is what you've actually suggested in terms of... Oh, I've got to ask you what this is, David. What's that? It's another racer. That's pretty, isn't it? Yeah. That, but already you can see the leaves are being challenged now by the, either the frost oh, that we yes. had a couple of weeks ago, or is it 10 days ago, or they dry in the sun. So you have to be very careful about looking after those. We were fortunate to find when we arrived here, we had these um, fruit trees. So we've got apples and pears around the outside here. But inside, this was a complete mess. Uh, it was supposed to be a soft fruit cage, but... Um, it had rusted and we even had badgers actually trying to make a set in here. So what we've done is made this into a soft fruit and herb garden. So we've got the raspberries, we've got the strawberries, oh, raspberries, herbs, 
So you've got variety. main course over there and dessert you've got it. in this side. Perfect. You've got it. And, and the rhubarb, which absolutely loves it here. So yeah, so this is a, a nice enclosed area that certainly... You need the wine and beer growing trees and you'll be there then. <laughs> See what I can do, but of course we do have the cider from the apple. Indeed, indeed. So we're doing okay there. So this is probably the main border that we have got. Uh, but this is absolutely plagued by bindweed, so it's a constant challenge to me to try and keep the bindweed under control. But we're planting up again. Not being a, a gardener, David, bindweed does what? Strangles, it sounds it like it's it, going to do that? It, first of all, it's, it's a natural plant that loves growing here. In fact, we can show, I'm, I'm afraid I can show you an example. Uh -huh. If you look over the back there, you can see the bindweed climbing around and curling around the plant and oh, just trying to strangle yeah. everything yeah. and ruins everything. So you see it sticking out the top here. Oh, I've yes. got to ask you what this beautiful thing is. What this a is a cotinus, is. it's a smoke bush. Wow. So these, I'm sorry about the social distancing here, but these mm -hmm. flowers will just, they're not exactly uh, dominant flowers as such, but they come out and they're, they're nice to see. But later on, when the sun hits it, it looks like it's a smoke bush. I can just well imagine. In smoke. Absolutely beautiful. So, yeah, so it's kind of a deep purple colour. It's a lovely colour, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Lovely. So the old roses were here at the back. And then we've supplemented them with some more new roses that have come in. So again, the fruit, the old rose is going over already, which is a quite a shame. And we do have a lot of this in the garden. This is Hesperus. Again, the scent from this is tremendous. Uh, insects seem to like it a lot, but it self-seeds, so uh, it grows. John, this is a, we decided to divide the garden up. Um, this was a flower bed all the way down here, but it was just full of perennial weeds and we just couldn't get rid of them. So we decided we create a division by having this avenue of trees. Now, it just so happens that this path leads to a view of St. James's Church. Ah, okay. And St. James's Church has a particular um, uh, fondness, or I have a fondness for St. James's in particular because I came down to Somerset in 1976 to play cricket, yeah. and as a bowler, I liked bowling from the St James's oh, end. I see. So I just thought it was fantastic <laughs> that I could now look out and see the Tower of St James's uh, and bring back happy memories. <laughs> Makes sense. You were a fast bowler, David, right? Uh, yeah. When, when it went when it went right, it was, fast <laughs> and it was, okay. it was very enjoyable. And, it was and this was, of course, playing for Somerset. Yeah, it was a pleasure to be there at the time. It was yes. A time to be part of the squad. I don't know if you can if you just come down and you can zoom in. I think you, uh, you might just see the top of St James's now. You can just see it now. Let me go to your left. Yeah. Oh, I can just see the spire, yeah. And then you can obviously see the cricket lights. <laughs> yes. Um, and the top of the So now that uh, all the I'll leaves are... I'll try and are... zoom in. Hopefully people can see this. Yeah. Now the leaves are all in flower. Uh, sorry, leaves are uh, in leaf. Uh, we lose a lot of the view of Taunton and the lights at night, but it's lovely looking out over the top of Taunton. Yeah, I can well view. imagine. Do you see the lights of the cricket ground when they're on? We, we see when they're on, uh, but they're very, very directional and they're very good. They don't yeah. cast light out. But we're going to have a look at the rose garden now, John, and okay. this really is a disappointment that we can't transfer the scent from these roses. Yes. Both of the main species here are absolutely fantastic. So. The box hedging we've taken from cuttings and grown those ourselves to uh, give the edge and we planted this up. So when we arrived, whilst this was a rose garden, there was probably about half a dozen roses in total that were right. looking very sad and very disappointing. So we had to take them all out, clean the soil out, rejuvenate the soil and then plant up from scratch, having given it a rest. So what we have over here is most of these roses are called Winchester Cathedral. These are the white ones, and the pink ones here. They're a bit gorgeous, aren't are they? Gertrude Jekyll. So, and as you probably breathe in, you get a get the scent. Um, covered in bees here, you can see them buzzing around, which is fantastic. And the scent off of this can fill the garden as well. That's incredible. What so was it called again, though? It's a this is a wisteria. wisteria. It's a white wisteria. Um, now normally. You wouldn't get roses at this advance with this wisteria at this stage. 
So we've actually got so much scent going and around why, in the garden at the moment. I think it's just the, the weather. Oh, it's right. just changed and it's just, just happening. And then on top of that, we have this beautiful beauty bush, the Colquitsia, um, which has been out in flower again for weeks. It's been absolutely fantastic. That is one of the most impressive things I've ever seen it's, in the garden. It's gorgeous, isn't it? It, it really is. Absolutely. So what sort of age would that be? Well, if, if I just pull a little bit to one side, you'll see we had to prop it up. Aha! Uh -huh. um, so yeah. the trunk, I mean, if I don't think you actually be able to oh, see Oh, I can it. see a trunk here, actually. Well, there you go. if you can see it, it's very old and very gnarled. So wow. during winter, it's special as well. It is fantastic. See the bees <laughs> on there really enjoying that. Yeah, it's great. Gosh. And is this something that if you started afresh, can you plant one of these and have it? You, you absolutely, you can start. Um, you can start afresh with a plant and grow it as a standard. But I'm assuming that this house is 50 years old now. Right. I'm assuming this was probably planted pretty soon after that. So yeah. to get to that stage, we're talking decades. And uh, of course, we're just currently the caretaker of it. Sure. So, um, what a lovely way of thinking of it. It's a lovely plant. Tremendous, and yeah, it's got to be one of their most favourite plants. And it's a plant rather than a tree? Yeah. Wow. So I'll show you, we've got two more wisteria, which I'll show you. They, tree, uh, wisteria normally is grown up a wall, and we've got them on the south facing oh, wall. Right, so okay. to have it as a standard is, it's not rare, but it's unusual. But as you say... I, I can't think I've ever seen one. Okay. No, I, mean, I wouldn't know what a wisteria was. However, I would recognise that if I saw it somewhere else. Like, yeah. From memory, I've never seen anything like it. Right, well, you're, when Certainly. we show you... The it's wisteria. like a waterfall tree or something. Yeah, it? great description with, with all that cascading yeah. down. Having overwintered these, John, we have uh, two citrus plants. So these are bitter orange. Because they stay in the greenhouse and I keep them above five degrees over winter, uh, I actually get two crops of oranges a year off them. Wow. Um, but they are uh, a four season plant. So you can see here a flower. And keep my distance from you, go around the, this side. Yeah. These have beautiful scent. I mean, anybody that's holidayed in Spain or the Mediterranean knows what the scent of the, the citrus plants are. So we have, from the beginning, the flower right the way to fruits and all the stages. Um, so here's a little, little orange just starting here. You just see the fruit. So to me, they're four seasons. They're absolutely fantastic. And again, as these start to fade away, the scent comes from these and they are tremendous. I have to say, as a complete novice of gardening, I, I didn't realise you could grow oranges, lemons, that sort of thing in this country. Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah, so... Not outside of a greenhouse. Yeah, so as I say, we keep them five degrees, a minimum of five degrees over winter. Yeah. So that's important. Um, and then whilst you're there, John, we might as well just show you the lemons. So yes. You've got flowers, you've got lemons. Uh, because they're used by oh, I see them yeah. uh, in the gin and tonics. Uh, I'm afraid I can't supply enough lemons for <laughs> for everything that's required. And quite right. But too. again, for the four seasons, uh, they're beautiful plants, and to sit out here with the scent wafting across. And is tremendous. for the rank amateur with gardening, is this something that someone like myself, for example, could buy and put in the garden and and keep it Absolutely. going? Absolutely. This actually needs to be just kept above freezing, sort of one okay. degree and above. Yeah. So yeah. So Somerset, we're blessed. I mean, if you could put that against the south-facing wall. Absolutely no problems whatsoever. And there's a range of fruit. We have grown apricots um, uh, here. Uh, I'm trying to think of all the fruits that we've got. So growing fruit down in the Somerset with the current climate, no problems whatsoever. It's perfect, yeah. But I thought we'd just have a little wander up this way now, John. Absolutely. Have a look at the herbaceous border, which is coming on. Very much work in progress because I don't normally have everything planted up until the end of May. Um, and of course we had that frost a couple of a weeks, uh, a week or so ago, so we have to be careful of that. But I'm starting to plant this up now, and uh, this is trying to be a colourful border, right. uh, a light and bright one. Some people would say it's a hot border, but I've, I'm allowing plants to come in that don't quite meet the criteria of hot border. GM, and that's a particular variety, is called Mrs. Bradshaw. Yeah, she's very bright, lovely to see, so and flowers from very early on in the year. So this is an Estrancia, which I think is a beautiful colour that's coming on there. Yeah. But of course there's a lot of plants here. Um, uh, heliotrope, you normally just see these as bedding plants, uh, but I overwinter mine. And as a result, this purple will have that from... When you say overwinter, you keep them in, in the longer than normal? 
Yeah, so, okay. so if it was just a bedding plant, it would just be allowed to flower. It probably wouldn't be this far advanced in May. Gotcha. It would flower and then you throw it on the compost. But because it, it is a perennial, um, we have a bit of fun with those in the greenhouse. And then the salvias already beginning to look quite nice and coming on nicely. But the star of the show at the moment has to be the peonies. Aha. Yeah, when you've got flower heads like that in the garden, it's, uh, they tend to dominate. God, they're beautiful specimens, aren't they? So you've got the pink and then to your right is the white. So I'm sure uh, garden designers would say I've got the white next to the white, but hey, <laughs> we have to live with that. Yeah. Oh, fantastic. And this here, this is a different, obviously a different. So this is a Hesperus we saw okay. earlier on. Oh yes, yes, now I but remember. This one has got some of the purple as well as the white in it as well. So is that is that just the way the flower grows, or is it just luck? Or no, there's two different varieties that are growing together. Oh, I see. With my lovely bindweed growing up it as well. <laughs> there's some more work for me to do. And then we've got the taller salvias at the back coming on. And this, this is where you can see now the, um, uh, the cannas. So yes. the, for the purpose, growing up against a green background with the dark leaves, they'll stand out. They're going to be over six feet tall wow. in about uh, six weeks' time. <laughs> so uh, they're fantastic. And these are the green ones. These are the green cannas that are going to... But they don't grow so tall. They're only going to grow to so high. Oh, so they've got a much lighter leaf, haven't they? Yes, a yeah, much greener leaf. Uh, a garden that we designed so this is completely new to uh, the garden that we've put in obviously taking into account the wellingtonias at the back and the holly over to the right so basically everything else here we've, we've brought so the actual pond uh, the idea originated in the lost gardens of heligan when we saw the italianate garden and the pond down there right. that was the thing that started to trigger the planning so it was from there that we managed to work. Um, so Roy Sweet, uh, the builder, local builder, helped me put this together. Um, Stuart doing the work. And uh, we worked on this, including what we call the freeze house for the built-in barbecue. So this is where the family spends a lot of time when we can get a chance to relax. The water lilies, uh, mainly white and pink and they, we should have our first water lilies very, very soon now, coming up. So we've got the yellow iris at this end, and the white lilies have been magnificent this year at the end, the iron lilies. And our heron, who doesn't do a very good job of keeping the real herons <laughs> off. Oh, does he so not? we have them come in and visit. But how lovely, I know that probably not what you want, but... Oh, I'd have wildlife visiting. Oh, yeah, lovely. Wildlife... Um, you'll see the state of the gardens. The lawns were absolutely magnificent three weeks ago, but since then they we've look had wonderful, no? regular visits from badgers that are digging them up. So oh, that's really? Not to be recommended. <laughs> so here, so this is a, obviously a pond where we've got a rill, where the water is filtered up there and comes back down. And what we've got, you'll see here, is more aces at the back here. Different types of aces growing here, different coloured aces. And a very good friend of ours, Clem, gave us the uh, pine here in the pot. And oh I just right, thought it was a lovely there. place. A as, as Clem and Val were clearing out their garden, we found a place for it at the top of the rill, yeah. underneath the statue. And I think that's uh, beautiful. Yeah. absolutely beautiful. So that, I believe that plant is over 40 years old. Yeah. So he's done very well there. It's a water like a lovely nose. Absolutely. It's so, relaxing, so relaxing when yeah. you can actually sit. Obviously we can sit and relax and enjoy and read. Sure. Or just sit and just listen to it. Whilst the lawns were looking great three weeks ago, we've had regular visits from badgers. Okay. So what we've done is we've set up this badger trap in the sense of, if it comes through here, it makes a noise, <laughs> which is enough to scare it away from this side of the garden, or it hits the water bottle. And I don't know if it will make the noise, but if you hit the water bottle, it yes. makes the noise and rolls and the water continues to rattle around in there. And it scares them away. Well, since we put this out, we've had no badges on this side. <laughs> but now they're on that side. Oh, so no. we have to go and work out something that's bigger to 
They're now. probably thinking right this way tonight, lads. Exactly. Follow me. <laughs> so anyway, we'll keep this here for the time being. Right, right. John, you mentioned earlier on about the ranges of greens uh, in the earlier part of the garden. Yeah. If you look around here now, there's just more greens to look at, and in particular, the catalpa, um, catalpa biganoides. The nickname is the uh, civil service plant. Last to arrive in spring, first to go in, aut in autumn. <laughs> so um, I, I'm only passing on the message. I didn't actually make that up myself. Indeed. But it's a beautiful, and the leaves are going to get bigger, and it becomes uh, absolutely fantastic. And standing out against the copper beach at the back is is absolutely brilliant. Lightens up this space tremendously. Gosh, what a magnificent thing that is, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, that is. That's, and that's had to be pruned down because we lost a bough about four years ago. And uh, Nigel Howard, who was here at the time, he and a colleague went up and cut all the branches down to make it more symmetrical again, and they did a great job. Yes, I see what you mean about the green against the copper. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah, very beautiful. So now we have here a tree, a Cornus controversia variegata. There you go. Uh, the wedding cake tree is its common name, because if you look at the way it's growing, it's growing in tiers. And the flowers are just going over, so oh, when see, these are yes. all out in flower, yeah. it will be nice and white and look just like a wedding cake. So that's, that's gorgeous. Really that's yeah. going to grow into quite a size. So the next tree worth mentioning is this one here. When people talk about aces, wow, uh, they don't often think of aces being this big in the garden. And this particular acer, which I think is a magnificent tree in itself. But the autumn colour on this, this is the last tree, Persica, which also has beautiful autumn colour, but it's earlier than this one. Right. So it, this whole area turns red uh, yeah, from August on. So I'm going to show you another tree. Oh, which... I can see the church well now. Yeah, St Mary's now. Let's see if I can zoom into that. Yeah, it's got it now. There we are. Yeah. yeah. So we call it Glauca because it's blue in colour. Okay. Um, interestingly, it lost its leader about three years ago, which is the top part, and that has now grown and taken over as the lead on it. So it is, uh, it's grown pretty well. That's probably doubled in size since we've been here, and it's deemed to be a slow growing tree. You can see the size of the trunk is a, yeah, it's a beauty, it's a, isn't it? It's of a good size. Usual colour, isn't it? It is unusual. Sort of fades in and out of green. Yeah, and look at that. So we've got the new growth, which is coming on here, beautiful. And then these, and I don't know if you've ever seen the, I'm not sure if you'll pick it up, but if you've ever seen the dust that comes off of the pollen when you when you knock one of these, it's quite amazing how much pollen actually comes off. It almost it's looks a, as though it's a, a child stuck them together, <laughs> doesn't it? Yeah. It's quite strange. So on the, on the subject of aces, we've got two beautiful aces here. Aces it's almost like your garden's got a whole range of yes, aces. Yes, there is a range of aces here, so which is lovely to see. Oh, my favourite bindweed again. Look, managed to get all the way through there. <laughs> I presume there's nothing you can put down to stop that? Is it no. put it all out manually? Um, unfortunately, the roots on these go down a long way, so they survive in the drought when everything else is struggling I see. to thrive. The Acer, this is an Acer Gryceum. Um, and the thing about this Acer is the leaf, is the stem and the bark peels and when the sun catches the peeling bark it's a beautiful, beautiful colour. Why does the bark peel then David? What's the reason for that? Uh, that's a very good question. I've got no idea Seems why it does. It's a strange thing to do, doesn't it? But it but the fact it does and it gets bred accordingly and we all have lovely, lovely trees. A plant that's beautiful is for its scent is a Philadelphus and this one, if only you could transfer the smell on this one, it's absolutely stunning. It's coming on. So that's going to be a massive white very, very shortly. It's Again, this incredible out. difference in colour here. Yes. And it all blends perfectly, doesn't it? It all comes together nicely. 
I was saying the church back there, that's a different church, that's St Mary's isn't that's it? And the other one was St James wasn't it? Was it? James, yeah. Right. So that's Hammett Street just there? Yes, straight <laughs> down. So here we have another acer, it is permanently red. Wow. Very nice. And that's all year round? Well, whilst it's out in leaf. Got you. But this is a very new tree to the garden, this is the Prunus cerula. And this was planted in memory of a dearly beloved dog, Spike, oh, who passed away at the beginning yeah, of the year. Yeah, I remember Spike. So um, Spike was a jet black dog, but his, his grandparents, gra grandfather I think was mahogany, and Spike just had mahogany coming through in places. Ah. So we've got mahogany peeling bark here. So oh, lovely. Now I just want to show you these trees just as a lesson learned. So, these are, these are silver birch and you can see they're very, very, very white stemmed. I bought them with the aim of them being multi-stem, but didn't know at the time that horses like to prune them. <laughs> so the horses have pruned them all the way up to there. So I've got the weirdest shaped silver birch Ever. going. So it's supposed to be four. And this one's hanging on. I'm going to show you another tree in a moment that the horse has done good for me. <laughs> Yet. So, what we've got here then is, in the spring, this area here is completely covered in daffodils. Oh, beautiful. So, what we've decided is to let the daffs die down, so you can see the uh, stems, stalks here just dying down, and allowing the grass to grow, just to see what we can get back in the way of um, insects, invertebrates, whatever, and just allow them to come in. So the Picea omerica here, that will continue to grow nicely, but... Um, this becomes quite a large wildlife area if we can encourage. But nice that you've done this with the garden. You've got different areas for different things. Different areas, absolutely. Well, that's nice. You're looking after the wildlife too and the pollinators. Well, we're trying to. Yeah, but when we come around here, you can see it's quite a large area that we've, uh, we've put down. And we've put some plug plants in. I'm not sure if they've taken because the grass is quite rich here. So we've got the uh, rhododendrons in the background, but plug plants have gone in. And when you say plug plants, these will develop into what? So they're, they're literally grown so that they're in a pot. Right, and then oh, I can I see. dig a hole and put them in. So they're already established plants before they go in, gotcha. rather than just sowing seed. Because seed struggles to compete against everything else that's growing. So, I mean, for example, I'll show you a plug plant. Here's, here's one that I planted a couple of weeks ago. It's in the ground, it's growing up above the grass now and looks like it's doing okay. So this is uh, developing into a woodland area. So rhododendrons, azaleas, various things. And on this side, in the spring, this is just full of crocus, uh, blue and white mainly, but the yellow, snakes head fertility, uh, So this is just a mass of color before the leaf comes out on the tree. So at the moment, the cow parsley is taken over and uh, Again, attracting wildlife. Absolutely. So, does that give you a flavour, John? Of, I uh, think, David, that is, a, that, that is absolutely wonderful, yeah. I think some people may have uh, been here before because we've had a couple of charity of events and uh, hopefully next year we might be able to do something and open it up and encourage people to come and see what we can do. Yeah. So, David, thank you, first of all on behalf of everyone really I mean this has been a, a real education for me I'm not not a gardener but I have to say this makes you want to be one I think oh, well, and uh, hopefully it's been a pleasure, John. indeed indeed but thank you very much really really appreciate the talk thank okay. you okay cheers thank you.